today on the East Special Needs Podcast, we have John. Um, you might remember John from the ABCs of IEPs. It's on our blog, it's on our website, we have a YouTube video, we have a Facebook Live. Um, John has a lot of really great insights into the IEP process, and he's here to share them with us today. So I'm going to let John introduce himself. Hi, this is uh, John Orth. Um, i currently a teacher at Great Circle. Used to be Edgewood Children's Center a long, long time ago. Uh, been there 30 years, and I was talking uh, with Catherine beforehand. I think I've probably written 250 IEPs or so. Um, and so back in August, I came and gave a presentation on ABC. So we're following up um, with the podcast today. So I'm here to try to give uh, some good information for parents that come to IEPs uh, to help them you know, navigate the IEP in the most efficient way so they can help, help their son or daughter um, the best they can. All right, so we're going to kind of go into a brief recap of the ABCs of IEPs, if you don't mind. So we're going to talk about like the, the about of IEPs, um, the basics, the components, and the organization. So if you just want to delve into that. Sure, I'll, I'll delve into that. Um, the, the IEP, the main part of the IEP, there are two main parts, basically, the present level and the goal section of the IEP. Um, the present level is a summary of everything that your child has been doing since the previous IEP, or if it's uh, an initial IEP, it's everything that they've been doing up to that point. There are, depending on each IEP, some IEPs are different from others, but most present levels have six sections to them. And the, the main components of the present level are current functioning. There's a section called changes in current functioning. There's another section called uh, how the disability affects the student's participation in general education. And there's a very important part of the present level, which is um, concerns of the parent and another part, part, which is strengths of the child, which a lot of times those are the sections with the least amount written in them, which is, I always think that kind of should be the opposite. You know what I mean? So you'll, you'll look at an IEP and there'll be a, a six paragraphs on what the child is doing well and not doing well, and then there'll be strengths of the child, there'll be four sentences. So Right there, that, that's, that's always difficult for parents to have to deal with that, I think. You, you come into an IEP, but already a little bit on the defensive. But the, the, that's the basic part of the present level is it's briefly the teacher and therapist talking about how the student is doing, what they can do better, um, changes, and then the parents get to... Um, let everyone know their main concerns about what's going on, and then you talk about strengths. But uh, that's the present level. That's a very brief summary of of a section of an IEP that usually takes about 30 minutes to go through during the actual IEP. Um, the goal section is based on what was talked about in the present level. So in the present level, the areas that um, were discussed where the student is struggling, there, have, there has to be goals written for them. So if, if the teacher is talking about student struggles with remaining on task, there has to be a goal written about that. If the teacher is talking about student struggles with remaining regulated during the school day, there has to be a goal written on that. And if, if it's an IEP, if it's a, you know, an annual review where this is like the second or third IEP for the student, if they have services like speech and language or occupational therapy, the speech and language uh, uh, person and the OT person, they have to be present and they have to give a present level. So as I was saying, that the goals, the goals are based on what was written in the present level. So it, it, again, like I talked about, if whatever issues the student is struggling with, there has to be a goal. There has to be a goal written for it. Um, also on a present level, there is a section called changes in current functioning, and that's where um, the old goals are reviewed. So if it's not in initial IEPs, this is, I'm talking about a student who's been in special ed for several years and they have an annual IEP, you review his previous goals. 
And the team then decides during that time whether or not they want to continue with those goals, whether or not um, the, the student has met the goals, whether or not they want to keep the goals but tweak it a little bit. And um, that's a team thing. When, when I do IEPs, I always include parents. When I'm saying these are the goals that I have, I always stop and ask, do you like that goal? Um, is there something I could add to it? Do you not like that goal? Um, is there something you want me to work on? And surprisingly, most parents are, are, are okay with what you come up with. I do have some parents say, but he, my, he really struggles with this at home. And then when that's brought up, I will think about it and say, yeah, that's an issue in the classroom as well. But I may not have um, mentioned it or talked about it too much in the present level. So the, the, what I have to do then is go back and add that into the present level if I want to put a goal in for him to work on. And which we do because the, the, the IEP meeting, is just, that's just the draft IEP. That's not the official thing. You're, you're going through it and you make changes as you go. So I'm flexible with that. So if a teacher, said, if a parent says, um, John, you didn't say so-and-so uh, at home when he has homework, he tears it up. And I can never get him to do his homework. And then maybe I don't see that in school, but what I can do is I can put that in. Parent expresses concerns about homework being torn, torn up, and then I can write something. In the, I'll put that in a present level, and then I can write a goal for them that will help them at home as well. Not all teachers are willing to do that because it's a separate issue, but I do that to uh, help, help the parents. The... The, the issue with goals, too, is they have to be written in a way that the kid can meet the goal. I mean, if a kid is off task 80% of the time, which is typical for types of kids that I have, for me to write a goal that says Johnny will be on task 80% um, of the time with one prompt in 15 minutes, that's an unrealistic goal if he's off task 80% of the time. So it's important that if you're sitting there as a parent, you, you hear these things what teachers are saying about your this is a severe problem. The goals had to be written so the kid can meet the goals so they're, so they're having some success. Um, and, and I'm always open to any parental input that, that I get during you know the present level part or the goal part. And most of the time parents have very insightful things to say because parents know their kids more than we do. And bringing up things that they see at home makes teachers think about maybe that's going on in school too I'm just not really recognizing it so it's really a team effort and the more the people feel secure giving their input the better you know the the IEP is going to go um, so that's present level and goals so okay. yeah. sorry to derail your train of thought but say for example that kid that's like off task 80% of the time what would be your realistic goal that you'd put in your IEP for that I always like the 50-50 rule. I mean, for him to meet at the end of the period, so today is March 26th, say we're having an IEP today. His annual IEP would be next year, March 25th, the day before. If he could get up to 50% of the time, by that time I consider that would be a good goal. Yeah, so like 50% productivity? Mm -hmm. okay. 50%. I mean, and also off task, you have to define what is off task. Yeah, what is off task? Off task can be many things. For a lot of times people think they know what off task is, but, you know, off task can be external distractions and internal. There can be a kid sitting very quietly in his seat, but he's internally distracting and not hearing one thing you're saying. That's off task as well as a kid who's up out of his seat running around the classroom. So you have to define that and, and you have to be able to, as a teacher, to justify your goal. So if I'm in a meeting, I just can't be pulling numbers out of the air and say, yeah, he, Tom's off task 80% of the time. Well, how do you know he's off task 80% of the time? I can't say, well, I, I think he is or it seems like it. So the, the teacher is keeps track of that and many different ways. It can be the old fashioned way where you have a notebook out and you're actually doing little slashes. You can have formalized data pages printed out and you're doing it every 30 minutes. Um, you have to do something in order to look back to say, because what your perception of a kid being off task might be different from what he really is. 
Uh, but yeah, 50% of the time, a kid who's off task 80% of the time uh, would be a fair goal. Okay. Um, so back to what you're talking about earlier. I'm sorry. The, the, yeah, I was in, I was fin- yeah, I was finishing up on the goal part. Yeah, yeah. talking about the present level and about the goals. Um, once all the goals are are um, presented, everybody everyone is asked everybody okay with these goals, and then the the district representative will add his or her two cents about what they do or don't like about the goal, and then they'll bring up a suggestion, and then. All that kind of gets uh, written down. The, we have at Great Circle, uh, her position is a process coordinator, which means she's in charge of all the IEPs. So she kind of navigates the IEP while I'm talking and doing my part. She's taking notes, and like uh, the, the district person rep could be saying, well, you guys need this and need that, and she's doing all that stuff. So everything is, is taken care of uh, that way. So everybody's in agreement with the goals. I mean, there are other parts of the IEP, you know, I can go into now. There's a, a, the, the, you know, the present level is a main part. The goals is a main part. Um, another big section is a part of the IEP called placement. So you run through the different placements that a kid can go to, and you start with least restrictive. You know, there'll be a, there'll be a part where it says uh, Johnny can be in regular education 100% of the time. Then underneath, and there's usually on the IP there are check there are check boxes. Either the team is in agreement, yes, he can do that, or no, he can't do that. Then you go to the next level, which would be Johnny is in regular ed seventy percent of the time, and thirty percent of the time he's getting resource help, which would mean a special ed teacher. He would leave the classroom and go to special ed services. And you you discuss that. You bring that up to the parent. The team talks about it. You check, it was considered, it was either agreed or disagreed. Then you move on, you go all the way down, the the least restrictive is hospital setting. And then uh, right above that is homebound. And then you have like where I work, which is a private purchase of service facility. And this is where agreement or, or disagreements come up a lot. I mean, a parent will think that my kid doesn't need Special ed services 100% of the time, they need it 50% of the time. And the district is saying, we've tried that and we have we have data to show that it's not working. We have to provide more services. So, so the placement part, placement consideration part, sometimes is where there's disagreement, which is fine, but it has to, the team has to agree. So before the IEP is over, that has to be agreed upon. And, and sometimes that's a stickling point. Once in a while, the, the IEP won't it'll have to be uh, resumed because team can't come into agreement on where the kid you know, should be placed. Uh, so the, the placement part is a, is a big part. Usually that, takes, that can take some time. And, and other times it's very clear that the kid needs to be where I work. And you purchase a service place and the parent is happy as can be with them being there because that's it's just you know, that's where the kid needs to be. The other part about that is if if the district can't, or if you can't justify their placement, that's that's a problem. I mean, I can't I can't write a present level, and I have I've listed very few of any behaviors in the present level. You know, just minor stuff, and then we go through the placement considerations. And we go all the way down to this very restrictive setting, and I say, yeah, he needs to be in a very restrictive setting. If I just wrote in the present level that uh, he's he's showing no aggression, he does not elope from the classroom, he's not using profanity, he doesn't hit his peers, but he's off task, that doesn't justify a purchase a separate purchase of service placement. So the whatever is spoken about in the present level, it has to be backed up with data. And then when a placement part comes up, you have to look at it like that. You can't, on the one hand, say this kid has no behaviors, but then when it comes to placement time, say he needs to be in a separate place. You know, it do, that doesn't work. So that's something that parents should, you know, should be aware of. What, whatever was the, the, the amount of behaviors a student is showing will dictate what placement they will go to. Not somebody's opinion, okay. what the kid does. 
So let's say, like, how do you handle that conflict in an IEP meeting about placement? So parents, I know, sometimes can be defensive. You were mentioning it earlier. Mm-hmm. But, like, how, how do you, as an individual that writes IEPs, help manage that? I, or how can parents manage that? Sorry. Pa- parents can, that, you know, it is, the district has a responsibility to find the most appropriate education for any students in their district. When they come to us, the, the, the districts are coming, the districts are sending the kids out of their district to us. So they have to have good reasons for doing that. So the amount of uh, disagreements that we have at placement time is not as much as you would typically see if a kid were still in their district in a less restrictive setting, I guess. Um, but I, I do it by using data and by showing a parent, if a parent is saying, Look, uh, John, he, he can do resource help. He just needs resource help and he'll be fine. And then I can come back and say, you know, Johnny was restrained 15 times last year in our school. Uh, this place where you want him to go does not, they don't restrain kids. And so if he gets that out of control, what's going to happen is he's going to get removed from that facility and then your son or daughter is going to go down this road again where they're getting kicked out of school. They're going to be out of school for a little bit. And they'll get homebound services, but then you'll have to find another placement. So if you can show, if you can justify by showing facts to the parents, look, this is why I'm suggesting this, recommending it actually because of these behaviors, and this would be in his best interest to do this. Many, most of the time parents say, okay, well, I didn't know that. A lot of times just parents don't know what, like, what does resource help mean? You know, what does that mean? And, and then you explain to them, well, that means that your son's going to leave the regular ed classroom for 45 minute period once a day or twice a day. And then he's going to be in regular ed. It's, it'll be a resource teacher. Nobody else in there to help. The kid can't get so out of control where he needs to be restrained. If that happens, he can get kicked out of that place. Um, and the same token, if the kid is showing no behaviors, no aggression at our school and it gets to the point where we're recommending that uh, the student is ready for a less restrictive setting a lot of times parents push back on that and they don't want that because their son or daughter has had such a long struggle in school for years they're worried about them going back into a less restrictive setting because it's like well i know it i know with and he, at Great Circle, Mr. John, I know they can handle all the behaviors, and that's kind of why the behaviors have gone away. I'm worried that when he goes back, he's going to show those behaviors again, and then it's going to start all over again. So you have to uh, uh, alleviate parents' worries many times with, look, he was here for a year and showed no aggression, and, and, and our goal is to get kids back on track. And we, we can try it. And what, what we'll, most dist- districts are open to then is like a transition, where if a parent is not willing to agree to like a full, like going from a highly restrictive setting to regular ed, it'll be like, well, they'll go to, they'll stay with me one or two days a week and they'll go back to that school one or two days a week, a slow transition, see how they do. They're doing fine. Then you up the amount of time that they're away from our place. And you can usually find common ground. Most of the times the parents will be fine with that to say, okay, well, at least I know this way. If something happens at the other school and he gets out of control, I know he still has a placement at, at Gray Circle. So, um, yeah, that's how that, how that works. So from like a parent's perspective, would you say that it might be a good idea to tell them that, you know, you are in this position, you've been doing this for X amount of years, Mm -hmm. you're an educator, you're your suggestions and your recommendations aren't necessarily based on any emotional standpoints. They're based on facts. So that parent in that position should probably trust you. In fact, they, they need to trust yeah, you. They, yes. The, the important thing is to look at what is going, what the student's doing. Mm-hmm. And it can't be your perception of what you think they're doing. It is what are they doing? You know, are, are they acting out? You know, it, it's as simple as that. And if they are or aren't, that will dictate how you treat the kid moving forward. Uh, but like I said, we, we have a, a lot of parents, once the kids are successful at our school, they don't want them to leave because they're worried that they're going to fail once they come back, which does happen. Mm-hmm. But you, you can't, you cannot tr- stop trying to have a kid go back to a, a least restrictive environment just because you're afraid it might not work. 
you know. Um, that's a hard thing for a lot of parents. Like where we work, that's a hard thing because many parents are just happy as can be with them staying with us for years because they know they don't have to worry. So it sounds like the transition for the parent might be more difficult than for the child. Yeah, I think so. Many times kids will tell you that they're ready to go back and they want to go back. Other times when kids are doing well at, at Great Circle, and if you bring up the subject of, you know, you're, you're doing really well, we're going to start talking about, you know, you going back to your regular school. Then either on purpose or not, kids will start acting out then, you know. And so that's always a tough call to know when you should tell a kid that's going to go on or, or, or if you even should. I think it varies from kid to kid. There are some kids you just don't, you don't talk to them like that. But, I mean, other kids, um, you can, but... It, it, it depends on the kid, and, and some districts are, are different about that, too. Some districts are not willing to do transitions back. Other districts, that's the only way they will take a kid back. And then other districts are both ways. So, again, the IEPs are all, are 95% of all IEPs are the same, but the way you go about getting certain services and transitions and placements are a little bit different from district to district. So in IEPs after placement, what is the next thing that you guys discuss or what do you do? We, after we decide where they are going, it's, it's brought up, are there, is everyone happy with the IEP? Does anyone have any concerns about the IEP? Is there anything that we miss that we can talk about more? And uh, the placement part is usually the last part of the IEP. And then the, you say, okay, we're going to, this is a rough draft. We're going to go through and make some adjustments to it. And we will send it home. We give them the option, like at, at Great Circle, I, we usually just mail it home to them because our kids are not reliable with taking stuff home. Um, and then we tell them within 10 days, they'll get a copy of the, of the official IEP. But the placement part is, is always like at the very end of the IEP. And because uh, sometimes that requires a little bit of time, you know, to discuss placement. That's that's the big part of the IEP. It sounds like it's like the trickiest part for yes. you guys, for the kids, for the parents. Yeah, because the it requires a little bit of you had to go by facts, but you also have to go a little bit with uh, um, past experiences with um, with kids and certain types of behaviors that that districts are more willing to deal with than others. I mean, most districts are unwilling to deal with any type of aggression. You know, aggression is no, you know, and they can deal with the off-task behaviors and, and those types of things. But, um, yeah, because parents and, and parents get sensitive about that. I mean, here everybody's talking about their son or daughter, and I can see how that would it, you get very defensive about it because then – it's implied by some people then, well, you must not be doing a very good job as a parent if your kid is this, has this many problems. And that, that is not, that's not the case usually. Yeah, that's a conversation that I really want to have is how, so when a parent is going into an IEP meeting for the first time, mm -hmm. like let's say it's their kid's first IEP, what are they faced with? Like how many people are there usually? Um, how should they bring a friend? How should they communicate? How should their mindset be going into it? Sorry, that's a lot I, of questions. Well, that, <laughs> that's a good question. We were talking about this earlier. I mean, at the IEP, um, typically it would be the special ed teacher, the district representative, the principal. Um, if, a, if a student has speech and language or OT, there'll be a speech and language person there. There will be an OT person there. Great Circle does individual therapy and group therapy. So there's a therapist there that works with the kid. Some kids have music therapy, some kids have art therapy. So you could have, one parent could walk into a room and when she walks in there could already be seven or eight professionals sitting in a room. So that has to be a bit overwhelming, I would think. And it is perfectly okay to bring a friend with you. That is the parent's right, you can do that. You can bring, um, anyone with you to help you feel you know more secure but don't go in thinking that people are there to talk about your son 
our daughter. The people on the other side are there to talk with you about how to help improve your daughter or son's life. And anybody that, most people that are in special ed, that work in special ed, that is their goal. So it, it shouldn't be, and I, I know that many parents have had negative experiences with school districts and, and teachers and the way they have handled their, their kids and they, their views are negative, but the, the, the team is there to help the, the, the student. And if, if you go in with that mindset, I think you'll get a better result. And you are, as a parent, you can ask any question you want, you know, because you are ultimately in charge. You can ask, uh, you know, if I'm blabbering on about Johnny not being able to do, uh, I don't know, double digit math or something, you have your right to say, well, how do you know? What do you, can you show me how you're trying to teach him? Well, how are you trying to teach him? Can you show me something? Um, Ask the teachers to show you. I have a, it, they call it a data binder. I have a, an, a binder, and in a binder I bring work samples, data sheets, uh, point sheets. I have all this stuff, and I have it all labeled, and I have it sitting there for, I have it ready for the parents to look at and the district to look at. If they want to look at anything, you know, they, they can look at it. Is that a typical thing that... Great Circle started doing that last year. Okay. So I not everyone it. might not have everyone, that. Not everyone will might have that, but hold the teachers and the people working with your kid accountable because that's 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 my job. And ask for, say, well, can do you have work samples? You know, what, what are you doing with my kid in reading? What are you doing in spelling? When you said he got into a fight, um, explain that. Ask the teacher for examples. Ask teachers what they are doing. Ask them about how the school day is. What does the day look like? All these things give you a better picture of what your son or daughter is going through during the day. I mean, those are all fair questions. The bringing somebody with you is is really good for a lot of people because you, you don't feel quite outnumbered because. Um, I think that's just your natural instinct when you walk into a room. Like you walk in, and you know, it's like, it's not you against, it's not, it shouldn't be a battle, it's a team. And you're just kind of all finding your place on a team, how to help son or daughter the best you can. And yeah, it sounds like it is intimidating, but it's not meant to be intimidating. It's not meant to be. I just think it's the nature of the way it's set up that you have to have these IEPs once a year. It, it, you, you have to have an annual IEP once a year. And, oh, by the way, a parent can call an IEP meeting anytime they want. So say we did an IEP, we're doing an IEP today, March 26th. And three weeks later, parent is really concerned about something and says this needs to be readdressed or something. They can, you can call another IEP. Parent has a right to do that. So you would meet again and discuss the concern they have. We interrupt this episode of the eSpecial Needs podcast to let you know that our busy bin is now 10% off with the offer code GETBUSY at eSpecialNeeds.com. You can claim this offer between May 23rd and June 20th just by typing in the code GETBUSY at the checkout. That's G-E-T-B-U-S-Y. So... What should a parent bring to an IEP meeting? Because I know in your ABCs of IEPs talk, you kind of talked about how important it is to get organized, how to how important it is to like have those materials that you're being provided in an IEP meeting on hand. You know, what what should a parent do to prepare? I would do maybe not to the extent that I do, but I like I we I call it a data binder where I have everything prepared so I can look back because it's good to have that visual for a parent to see. The parent could do something very similar. They could either on their phone or wherever, however they want to do it, really sit down and think about, what am I concerned about? You know, think about it before you go into the IEP. Because if, if you haven't really thought about something like, when it's your turn to speak on the IEP in the present level, you know, I'm, I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm talking, and 
if you talk too much, people tune you out and are not really listening to you. And then you get to a section that comes up that says concerns of the parent. Then the, the district person will say, okay, uh, Mary, it's your, your turn. What are your concerns? And, you know, if you're sitting in front of seven people and you haven't really sat down beforehand and written them down and really thought about them, you might forget. You, you might be sitting there thinking, well, yeah, John talked about off task. Yeah, yeah, blah, blah. And then you might really forget what your big concern was because you just because it's too many people. And, and so I suggest thinking about things like that, writing down what you want to talk about and bring it with you so you so you don't forget, because I think that sometimes that happens. Uh, uh, it's a, a parent has many things to say, but they don't say it because they either were overwhelmed with all the information that's being thrown at them and they had some good points. The parents had some good points, but they forgotten them because of what was said. So I would think about it beforehand and, and really write, I would write it down for me. I'd write it down cause I'd forget it. I would do. So that makes or, perfect or sense. on your phone, put it on your phone, whatever you want to do. So you have it. Um, that's one thing. Bring a person, like you said, that's perfectly fine. You feel more secure with a friend next to you. And, and go into the IEP. If you've gone into IEPs before and it's always been negative, try to go in with a different point of view that, that look, these people over here are doing this, not because they're making goo gobs of money, not because it's an easy job to do. These people are doing this because they want to help. And so I had to be open as a parent and listen to what they have to say and at the same time feel uh, secure enough to really express what I want to say back to them. And that will go a long way in, in producing a better IEP than one that can be kind of one-sided sometimes where the IEP is written from the teacher's point of view with little input from a parent or little input from other people. And that's not what you want. You want you want the, yes, I have to write it, but you want it to be everybody's part in there so it gives a complete picture of the kid. Right, you want it to be a conversation with several different people that are giving input. And I think sometimes the IEP process, because it's a very formal thing, I, you know, it's a legal document. That's number one, it's a legal document. And number two, it has different parts. You know, you have these parts you gotta go through certain sections and then you got to after a present level then there's a page called special considerations and then if your kid needs a behavior intervention plan there's a behavior intervention plan part there's a regular education part and all these different parts so on the one hand it's really formal so it's like well this is but you want it to be you, you want the information to be given in an informal manner even though it's a very formal legal thing because then you can still make it legal and formal without it being, you know, too rigid. I mean, a, a lot of times parents are just too overwhelmed. They see, you know, IEP can be that thick and it's just like, this is too much. I don't even know what you're talking about. You're talking about present level. You're talking about concerns. You're talking about BIPs and, you know, behavior intervention plans. You're talking about functional behaviors, all this stuff. I don't even know what you're talking about. So I'm not going to say much because I don't want to look like I don't know anything. So a lot of times that happens to people won't speak up or say anything because they don't want to make it look like, well, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't want to look dumb. But you shouldn't be that way because we do that for a living and, and they're a parent for a living. So they have information that we don't have that we need. So what kind of mindset should a parent have when they're going into an IEP meeting. So say, for example, I know I've noted that a lot of like social media, so Facebook groups specifically, like special needs parenting groups and stuff, a lot of them feel as though they're like a warrior for their child and like a supreme advocate for their child. And one of the things that I've seen is that so many of them seem to go into these IEP meetings with the idea that it's like an attack of their child. Mm -hmm. So how would you help a parent um, how would you help a parent have the right mindset going into an IEP meeting? Instead of looking at like it's the teacher or the district attacking my child, look at it like the district is helping you build your child. And from my angle as the teacher in the classroom, my view is coming right from the classroom out. 
and your view is coming from your environment and your home end, which I don't have. So on the one hand, I might be the expert in the room, but you're the expert at home and you're more of an expert in your kid than I am. So your mindset should be one of, uh, they are not trying to attack my child. These people are trying to help my child. So I'm going to go in with an open mind and let them know that, um, yeah, Johnny is aggressive, but he's also very, he's also can be very caring and empathetic to other kids. Yes, yes, Johnny uh, can use profanity, but he's also loves animals and takes care of animals. You know, to help paint a different picture of the of the kid that's been painted before. So going into mindset, not that the, they are here to attack my child. They're there. I always looked at it like I'm trying to help build your child in some cases like rebuild a child who who for some reason has fallen on bad terms and has struggled um not attack but we're there to help build your child okay so um from an educator's perspective like what do you think their mindset should be when going into an iep meeting the teacher mm -hmm. what, what yeah just teachers yeah. therapists anyone same thing open listen to parents like really listen to parents I was telling you earlier when on the present level, they like you to go through their, their like, I think six sections total. And of course, start with one, right? Then you go to two, then you go to three, then you go to four. The fourth one down, I believe, is concerns of the parent. And then the fifth one down is strengths of the child. I like to start off with the strengths of the child that I talk about. So I like to start my IEP with positives. Uh, instead of going into the problem behaviors that you're seeing, I, I, I go to the strengths first. So that kind of puts everybody on it. Even everybody's like, okay, this guy's not going to, he's here for the right reason. And that can really ease, that can really solve a lot of problems. Because if you have someone coming in, in the door and they're combative, well, a combative person needs somebody to fight with, right? So if you start the IEP out right away with, yeah, Johnny, yeah, three weeks ago threw a chair at me, hit me in the back of the head, or whatever you're going to say, which has happened, um, then right away if they're combative, their first thing they're going to think of is, well, you must have done something to my son, you know. But if you come into it instead of that, you come in with, Johnny is so empathetic towards peers when they're having problems. He's a great artist. He, he really can write very well positives and right away that combative part is kind of like put back it's already shut down a little bit not that it's gone but what can a parent say to that what do you mean by what do you mean my kid can be empathetic you know i mean they're not going to be like that they're going to be what's well, good this person has a different view of my kid that i hasn't that i haven't heard before so for teachers yes. and and people that are working with kids take that approach first i find that solves many problems i mean i think it solves so many problems that won't come up in the IEP just because of the tone that you set. Because the, the parent coming in already has a different view of you. As, as I said earlier, many parents have had negative, the kids have had negative experiences at many, many different schools. And you gotta change that somehow. So I would recommend teachers to stress the positive without, you know, you don't overlook the problems, you deal with the problems, but stress the positives first. Yeah, we kind of talked about this earlier about how when I worked at the YMCA on uh, inclusion kids, we'd have to give them a compliment sandwich. Mm -hmm. So that's a good, mm -hmm. just a good tactic to use is like compliment, bad thing, compliment. <laughs> I, I, start, <laughs> I start my kids out on the, the day when they come in, we, um, it's called uh, kindness break and they have to say something nice to somebody else in the room. That's how we start our school day. And Believe it or not, they'll get into arguments who gets to go first doing that. That's adorable. <laughs> so that doesn't mean they're going to have good days, but it, you're, you're, that's a different type of thought process. You know, these are kids that have had negative experiences with schools. And what am I doing? Well, the first thing you're going to do, you're going to say something nice to somebody, whether you want to or not. You're going to say something nice. And, you know, I have the younger kids, so it'll be something like, oh, I, I like your shoes. I don't really care. It's just that whole process of saying something, recognizing something in somebody. So again, getting that train of thought going that way instead of when I come in, sit down and be quiet. You know, that, that's, that's a big difference. Same thing with the IEPs. Start out positive, talk through and work through the problems that the kids are showing. And, but you have to be honest too. I mean, 
because honesty will be what helps the kid the most. Not overlooking problems and and uh, not overplaying problems as well. So have you noticed that the kid's school day goes a little bit differently than it would otherwise? It, or? it, it depends. I, I don't know because I don't, I mean, say a kid, we do kindness in the morning, they say something nice and they have a rough day. The way I look at it is, yeah, they had a rough day, but maybe if we didn't do kindness, it would have been really, 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 really rough instead of just rough. So, I mean, that, that's really a glass is half full view, I know. But it's just, a, I've always thought about that. The kids, you know, we teach math facts, we teach spelling words, but schools aren't teaching what kids are having problems with, which is being respectful and being nice. And I know it sounds kind of weird to say, what do you mean you practice being nice? I go, yeah, we practice being nice because a lot of kids don't know how to be nice. Um, and that does relate back to the IEP process a little bit which is, you know, parents a lot of times don't know how to, inter don't know how to do the IEP, you know, don't know how to interact with the IEP, don't know how to communicate their I I ideas. And same thing sometimes with uh, special ed teachers that kind of get stuck in ways of doing certain things the way things should be done. But um, the, the practicing, yeah. So like parents need to practice maybe getting ready for IEPs, you know, Write down your concerns. Uh, come up with some goals. What do you want? Write them down. Actually, write them down so you have them because that, you know when that time comes. I know I'm kind of all over the place here, but you know when that time comes, you're going to end up forgetting stuff. You guarantee because a lot's going to be talked about. Stuff you had in your mind is going to disappear. Can I just also ask how you came up with the little compliment thing in the mornings? I'm just I, curious. I swear that stemmed from. That came from uh, training I had several years ago. It was about, uh, I don't even remember the title of it, but the guy who gave the training really, it was a two-day training, and our whole school had to go to it. And uh, it went on a little bit too long, but the one thing I took away from it that I learned that I wasn't doing was enough of that type of stuff where... Um, he didn't have the kindness break. I kind of came up, kind of came up with it on my own. But he uh, he had things he wanted teachers to use called like brain breaks. You know, you, you do spelling for thirty minutes or whatever you're doing, then you stop, and a brain break would be like, okay, all right, you, here's some play doh. Play a play doh for five minutes, and we'll get back to work. It's letting your brain break. And I just came up with a kindness break because kids are can be so mean it's kind of like yeah you you can be mean after this but for this five minutes you got to be nice you know and uh i just stuck with it, it it's amazing that the kids argue about who gets to go first on the kindness <laughs> but yeah it, it it's so i started that several years ago nice mm -hmm. that's cool sorry i have so many questions that's all right. i was just curious because right. i've never heard quite anything like that so um so what's one thing that you wish that you would have known before you started your whole journey of like professionally doing IEPs and stuff? <laughs> Boy, one thing I wish I would have known. Sorry if that's a heavy question. That's pretty, that's a pretty deep question. Or what's one, the biggest thing that you've learned? Well, the biggest thing I've learned probably is that it's it's a little bit cliched, but no, I haven't had one kid that is the same. I've had many kids who exhibit the same behaviors. Um, and, I, and I've learned, I guess the biggest thing I've learned is that you have to have structure and rules for your classroom, but you have to be flexible enough to adjust how you implement those rules and structure according to the kids. So it's not fair for me to expect I'm thinking of one of my kids in the room now who's lower functioning than one of my other kids who is two years older who's higher functioning, but they both exhibit, they both exhibit the same types of behavior problems, which is severe aggression. They both had the same rules and they both had the same structures, but how I deal with the one kid is different from how I deal with the other kid. You can't have blanket the way you respond to each kid has to be a little bit different because, you know, everybody is unique. So that took a while to, I've learned, I've learned that. that. That takes, 
that takes a while to learn that and how to do that. Because um, just like everybody, you know, no, but no um, fingerprints are the same, right? Mm -hmm. No kid, the way they behave, the way you respond to them should be the same either. That took me a while to learn that and figure out the, the best way of working with kids like that. How did you learn that, just out of curiosity? Because that sounds like something that's more of an experience. Experience. Okay. Yeah, experience. When, when I first started, we, um, well, things were, that was 1989. And things were different, and I was different. I was a lot younger. And we had, that's a big thing, too. We, I had eight kids, and I, I did not have an aide in the room. So you, you had to learn how to manage behaviors, you know, so you're by yourself. You know, you're kind of thrown in, you're kind of thrown in and you, you all these kids with behavior problems. And and what you learn in school is beneficial to a point. But then you have to learn, well, how is you don't you know, you have to adapt and, and just learn how am I going to get through this day? And then you learn different ways and you start to learn about kids and people. And then that's how you learn how to manage things. It, it's it's a, it's experience and and. It is not for everybody, that's for sure. And if you don't, oh, oh, a big thing I've learned, going back to what you asked me earlier, <laughs> um, you can't fake caring. You, you can't go into the classroom. If, if you don't care, the kids know it. You can't go in there acting like you care when you don't. Uh, so that's one thing you can't practice is being, is caring. Because either you really do care or you don't. So, um, if you don't care about working with kids who have a lot of problems, I say don't go do something else. But uh, yeah, that 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 that's what I would say to that. Yeah, you, you you can't fake caring. What is the biggest takeaway for parents that you have when it comes to their IEP process? Come into the IEP process with an open mind. And come into it as you are the expert on your kid. The teacher is, I am not the expert on your kid. I'm, I'm the expert on classroom management, and your kid is in my classroom, but I'm not an expert on your kid. You know your kid more than I do. Give me information that will help me make him more successful in the classroom environment. That's, that's, what, I, that's what I give parents. Because um, then everything is better. Because I can manage the classroom and I can run a classroom, but like I said, I don't know your kid as well as you do. Okay. Um, so I'm going to wrap up unless you have more questions. Do you have anything else I didn't hit? Okay. So what is like a final word that you didn't get in if you wanted to say something and I was talking too much, but what's it, if you have final words? <laughs> Just remember that the, the IEP is, yes, it's a legal document. And kids who are in special ed have to have one yearly, but it is not the end of your kid's education. It's, it's, it's a process to help your kid get the best education he could get, he or she can get. And you are as much of in charge of the IEP as anybody is, because you are actually as big or the biggest part of the IEP. And if you're not, if you don't want to be involved with it, or you, you know, that's, Unfortunately, I've had that in the past where I've had parents who don't show up for IEPs. And we had to get, we had to reschedule two or three times because they won't show up. You know, we're all waiting for an IEP, a parent doesn't show up. And then eventually we just, by law, we can do it after they don't show up for three times. Please be involved in your, in your son or daughter's IEP. And things will be better for everyone in the long run. I mean, you have to be involved. Don't be afraid of the people there because, as I said earlier, most people in special ed are in it for the right reason, which is to help someone who has a disability of some type succeed and get back to a less restrictive environment. That's that's what the goal is. And even it can be intimidating, but go come to the IEP prepared and go into it with the mindset of my input will help my son or daughter succeed. All right. Thank you so much for coming in. You're welcome. I really appreciate all the insights that you have, and I'm sure our audience will as well. Um, if you want to check out John's full ABCs of IEPs, it's on YouTube. It's on our blog. Um, 
just go to eSpecialNeeds.com slash blog and you can search the ABCs of IEPs and it should pop up. Um, so thanks for listening. Thanks for coming in, John. You're welcome. I appreciate it. Thank Enjoy you. Enjoy doing it. This was very insightful. Thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode of the eSpecial Needs podcast. And a big thank you to John Orth of Great Circle for coming on as our guest. If you liked our episode, please make sure to share it on your social media. And if you want to see more episodes like this, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and pretty much just about anywhere else on the internet by typing in our name, eSpecial Needs. Thank you so much for listening. And please keep in mind that while these ideas might work for some, they might not work for all. In addition, the thoughts and ideas expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the thoughts and ideas of eSpecial Needs as an organization. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time.